So welcome to CC Colloquium for October 13th, 2021. Um, uh, we are thrilled to have with us uh, uh, Fran Baganel, who will be introduced uh, formally in a minute by Miniwadwa. I just want to say that this is another in a series of colloquia we try to do at least one every semester that is talking about uh, some of the issues, the broader issues around science, not the science itself. Uh, but I do want to stress that Fran is an incredibly accomplished scientist, as you'll hear, I think, from Minnie in the introduction, um, and has some really great science to talk about that we're going to try to make happen in the spring and through an in-person visit, if we can swing it, um, about uh, Juno and, uh, and outer planets. So um, this is probably not the last time you're going to be seeing Fran uh, in the next year or so. So with that, I'm happy to turn this over to uh, Minnie to introduce our guest. Great, thank you so much, Ariel, and um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's really my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Fran Baganol. Uh, Fran is currently actually an assistant director for planetary science at LASP, which is the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics at the University of Colorado. And uh, she's actually been at CU Boulder for, for much of her um, illustrious career. Uh, Fran is a planetary scientist who's involved or has been involved actually in a lot of outer planet uh, missions, including Voyager, Galileo, Cassini, and the two New Frontiers uh, missions, the New Horizons mission to Pluto, and the Juno mission to Jupiter. Um, her expertise is uh, primarily in studying magnetospheres of the outer planets uh, with a combination of spacecraft data and theoretical models. And she's received a number of uh, honors for her work, the most recent being her election to the National Academies just earlier this year. Um, so by the way, you might remember that, uh, you know, she, she actually was um, uh, in one of the documentaries recently called The Farthest that came out just in 2017 about the Voyager program. Uh, and, you know, if you've not seen it, you've got to go see it. It's uh, absolutely one of my favorite uh, documentary films. Uh, today, though, Fran is not going to be talking about the outer planets. As Ariel mentioned, we're conspiring to try to bring her back uh, in person sometime in the near future, hopefully next February. So please stay tuned. Um, and hopefully she'll be telling us about uh, the Juno mission at that point. Um, and today she's going to be talking about implications of some of the work that she's done on characterizing changes in the demographics in planetary and space sciences. And so um, welcome, Fran, and uh, the virtual floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. Uh, big disappointment not to be there in person, but, but really great to be with you and to talk about this very important topic of demographics of space sciences. And um, so I got started in thinking about this issue uh, 20 years ago, and I was wondering particularly about women in physics and astronomy. And I really wanted to move beyond what was called the woman problem and, you know, how to help these poor women, you know, do better. But really it's an issue of how do we train and retain the talent we need to do the job. And so I was trying to get a sense of the numbers and think about what was happening in the fields of uh, physics and astronomy uh, and planetary science in particular, but, but we'll come to that in a second. My thinking back then was that the women are the canaries in the mine. That is, if you pay attention to what, to gender issues, then and, and address the concerns uh, of what's happening there, why there was few women in science, then uh, we'd improve things for everybody. Um, but um, we're now learning that that's not necessarily the case and we have to think a little differently to apply this to all. You'll see what I mean by that in a minute. So first of all, uh, this is the overview. I want to talk, start big picture international view, then go to national, and then zoom in um, more locally. Uh, and the real issue is to find out where are the issues with the pipeline. I'll talk a bit about the pipeline in a minute. Um, and then how to fix them. And the mantra will be think globally, act locally, because we the easiest place to change things are locally. Um, but the bigger issues, uh, it's, it, it gives you a bigger sense, helps you think about what's going on maybe. Now, 
I put here a, uh, there's a whole bunch of um, acronym soup associated with various organizations. There's an overview organization called the American Institute of Physics. And they connected with them are things like the American Physical Society, American Astronomical Society, AGU. These are professional organizations that most of us belong to one way, one of the divisions or so. So maybe you belong to the division clients, the AAS, or maybe the AGU, or maybe what I don't have here is the GSA, the Geological Society of America, or something like that. We'll come, come back to those different ones in a minute. But the point is here that the AIP has a statistical division, a bunch of statisticians who are very experienced in gathering numbers. And I want to show you a bunch of the numbers that they've been gathering over the years. So let's think about statistics of demographics and things. And, and you know, I want you to be cognizant of the fact that, yeah, you'll see all these sort of plots, but also to be think thoughtful about what's going on. So this is a, an example of that I pulled up from somewhere that shows you um, the uh, percentage of women who are employed, young women who are employed, young to middle-aged women who are employed. And, and, you know, first you look at the numbers and you look at the numbers and think about the numbers. And then you think, um, of the interpretation. So for example, what is going on with the United States where it used to be the 2000, a little under 75% of, of women employed and now 2013, 13 years later, it was only 69%. So, you know, whereas in Japan, the numbers had gone up. So what's going on? And you have your ideas of what it could be. But you have to be careful because is this sociology, is it politics, is there something else? Or maybe it's just different ways of gathering the numbers. So buyer beware in all of these things. So let's look at the international view. And here is an interesting plot where I've got from um, AIP, number of physics bachelors in blue and in red, number of absolute number of PhDs. And you can see large numbers in the US over here on the left, then Japan and France, and Turkey and so on, going down to smaller countries on the right. Now there are missing countries here. Yes, notice that. But these absolute numbers are perhaps not the most important. What's useful is to look at capita production. So dividing by, this is the number per million population. And this is perhaps not what you would expect. So the United States has slipped off to the right here. And you'll see that in fact, the UK country where I was born, as you can tell from my accent, produces double the number of physics bachelors per capita than the United States. And who would have expected Greece, South Korea, France, Taiwan over here, and then to the right, these countries, Sweden, Australia, Netherlands, they are producing much smaller numbers of physics bachelors per capita. So what's going on here? Now, when we look at the percentage of women, I normally do this live and I get people to say, for A, hold up your fingers, one, two, three, or four, depending on whether you think it's Germany, India, Iran, or USA, and I do this for A and then G and then I, but I'm gonna jump and tell you what the answer is. And it's probably not what you would have expected. So US and Germany down on the left, low numbers, less than 20% or around 20%, undergraduate degrees awarded to women. Over on the right, we have India and Iran and Albania. I mean, I don't think you would have expected that. So um, these international numbers are food for thought. When we look at the percentage of degrees going to women in physics bachelors and in physics PhDs, what you'll see here is again, not really what you would expect in terms of countries like Turkey and Greece over here and over on the right, Germany, Switzerland, 
and Netherlands and so on, and the US um, in the middle. So these numbers test our preconceived notions and get you thinking about what's going on. This is a particularly interesting example, it really brings this out. There's a thing that, that um, is called the Global Gender Gap Index, and it's the sort of indicator of equality by gender. And as you would expect, Finland, Norway, Sweden are up here very high in this index. And then some countries over here where you women are not maybe given as, as treated as well, lower down global gender gap index. But what's surprising is when you correlate this with women in getting STEM degrees, are uh, anti-correlated. It's really not what you would expect here, right? So there's some other things that are going on and this international perspective um, is a bit of a wake up call. Now those data, you may have noticed the dates were quite old, but there's a new uh, interesting study that I want to draw your attention to, a book written by Norm Augustine. Oh, actually it was a committee um, that was chaired by Norm Augustine and Neil Lane. Norm Augustine, you probably know from the Challenger investigation, and Neil Lane was head of NSF for a while. Um, but they've written this book that warned um, the nation about um, lack of funding in science and technology and, and support of science and technology research, and also looking at the numbers and show that, for example, point out that um, China has got increasing numbers of uh, STEM degrees, undergraduate degrees, and the doctoral degrees. Uh, also, China is increasing, Europe is increasing here, and whereas the US is relatively flat. And so we need to think about this um, bigger picture um, when we're uh, looking at the workforce and what we need to do um, to keep our research going and how that affects our economy. So I encourage you to think about this book. So let's think about this issue of um, the pipeline of in STEM and um, where it is leaky, preferentially leaky for one type of person or another. Now I got some backlash when I started using the word pipeline and people were saying, oh, it sounds like sewage um, and we're humans, uh, okay, fine. Uh, but more importantly, yes, you can have a pipe with paths that go out and maybe come back. Uh, but people now really prefer the idea of a pathway or a branch, multi-branch pathway or river. And uh, in fact, here's from the AGU EOS article um, that shows careers and, and a, a multi-path braided career pathway, rather nice showing that to really think about careers in STEM and to have an inclusive STEM workforce, we have to really think not so much as a single line, a, a pipe, but more a branched path. But really what I would like to push is the idea of thinking, why do people choose different paths? And um, we really need to find out, we need to ask people and get some data on these issues. So my first experience with this goes a long way back. Uh, Sheila Whittle at MIT um, was actually uh, a mentor of mine when I first went to MIT. And she gave a presidential lecture in 1988 talking about this pipeline. And here we start off with 4 million 16 year olds in 1977 and look at how over the years they progressed in STEM um, the numbers drop down. You can see um, when you just look at the total number, the total number actually interested in, in um, natural sciences and engineering, that's what NS and E means, natural sciences and engineering, dropped drastically. There's a lot, relatively few. And of course, with women, it was a lot less back then um, than the men. And then there was a steady leak through the pipeline so that when you get to PhDs, one in a thousand women obtained a PhD in natural sciences and engineering, whereas five in a thousand men. So a factor of five different there. 
So um, that was the first idea and the drop off uh, was really an issue of showing interest in science and engineering in the high school level. So now when we look at it and we look at undergraduate physics education and I, I'm, I'm emphasizing physics here and I understand that for planetary science in particular and astronomy and geology, geophysics and astrobiology and so on, it's a much more varied, but, but physics is probably one of the larger uh, pipelines, um, career paths into uh, our field. Um, when we look at physics education, it's very interesting over time. So we go all the way back to 1955 up to 2000, and you'll see in blue, the total number of bachelors um, was ramping up. People were getting education um, since the 50s through to 2000. And if we look at physics bachelors, however, and you can see the big Sputnik spike here in the 60s to 70s, uh, but it's actually been pretty flat in physics at about plus or minus 20% of 5,000 bachelors in physics. Now we move forward and we get a dramatic change from 2000 to 2016, the numbers shot up uh, more than doubled. And you can see that people got the message that with a degree in physics, you can get a job, good paying job. Now, the problem is that women did not get the message. So if you look at the women uh, percent, the women, number of bachelors in physics going to women, it was increasing, but much slower than the men. And so we then have what totally surprised me when I first realized this and saw this, the percentage of bachelor's degrees going to women has been decreasing from a peak at around 2000 at 23% or something like that. It's looking like it's going to be around now about 15%. So this is a concern. We'll come back to the red line with the PhDs later. The percentage of women, percentage of PhDs, sorry, the percentage of physics bachelor's degrees going to women has been dropping for the past 20 years. Why? What's going on? Now, it turns out it's not just physics. It's actually across the sciences. So in biology, they have as many 60% women, but that number has sort of flattened out. So as it has in chemistry and in math and statistics. And look how in earth sciences, it's been dropping quite drastically over the past 20 years. And then towards lower down, we have computer science, physics, and engineering. All of these physical sciences are showing that the percentage of these bachelor's degrees earned by women has been dropping. So for some reason, um, they're not, uh, the numbers of degrees uh, in these science degrees um, uh, that are going to women has decreased. So now let's look at graduate education. So, um, the total number has been swinging up and down. That's the blue one at the top, but is now around 2000. And you'll see that, um, that the percentage of women is, is around 20% um, or so. But what's interesting is look at these middle numbers. The, the, the red one is the num US citizens and the Gray is the non-US, so this is non-US born, and I am right here, okay? <laughs> 1981, non-US citizen getting a uh, PhD in physics. Now, um, what you'll see is that the percentage of the non-US citizens has been increasing and has been roughly half for the past 20 years, okay? Um, and of course, the, the, um, the percentage of women has been going up. Uh, but notice also the very, very low numbers of Black, African Americans, and Latinx, Hispanic population. Really small percentage. We'll blow that up and show you in detail in a minute. But um, perhaps the fact that uh, there are 50% of PhDs are non-US 
And some of these are coming from countries where the percentage of bachelors in physics going to women is larger than in the US. Um, perhaps explains why, although the percentage of bachelors in the US going to women has been decreasing for the past 20 years, the uh, number of the percentage of PhDs in physics has been steadily increasing going to women. So it's around 20%, okay? And it would be interesting to know what percentage of those are non-US born. Now, when we look at astronomy, the numbers are smaller and they're much more variable, but you see a similar trend um, that there, there are in fact, the percentage of women is, is remained strong in PhDs, uh, but of course the black and Latinx has been small. And then, um, sorry, and these, these numbers um, are, are very small percentages. We'll come back to that, as I say, in a minute. Now let's look at where now, when we look at this leaky pipeline, actually where is it happening? So what is happening is that when you look at physics, the big drop off is from here, high school, where you're nearly 50%, down to college, where it's 20%. And it stays at that 20% through. Now, I did a study of this issue of whether or not the pipeline was differentially leaky for women between bachelors to, to, to astronomy to, sorry, to assistant professors. And what I found was that it wasn't actually. It turns out that once you get a PhD, um, the pipeline is not differentially leaky for women. So the real issue, the pinch point, as we put it, is high school to college. It's somewhere in there where we have a problem. And for physics, this is really stark. Chemistry, nope. Biology, nope. Those numbers remain from high school to college through to PhD. I don't actually have the numbers for professorship. But, but the point is, yes, there's a little bit of a drop off in chemistry here, um, but nothing like this huge decline, dramatic change between high school and college for physics. So what is going on? Well, various people have been looking at this and trying to study this. And um, in particular, there's these studies using these kind of cool diagrams where you could, this is UC Davis, where some people looked at various people coming in, in 2007 and asked them what degrees they wanted to study. And you can see math and physical sciences, this blue line. And then the outcomes in 2013, six years later, they found out, you know, how many people graduated with these different topics. And you can see that with math and physical sciences, it's something like 15% go through and graduate. The rest go off and do other things, right? Compare that with biology where it's like half of them graduate that came in. So the real issue is what's going on? Uh, how does this look year by year? Why do students move from one degree to another? What does it look like at your institution? What's happening with gender and minorities, racial ethnic minorities, and what's going on, different populations? Why are, is this happening? Let's do the research. There's no reason why every university couldn't be gathering these numbers and, and asking the students why they dropped out. Here's a, another example done by Stony Brook. It just sort of shows you um, this idea showing how people coming in, how many come out and where they go along the path. So this is important that we do this. This is the local action, right? We have this big issue of lack of um, uh, people getting all people, but particularly women and underrepresented minorities um dropping out along the way let's find out why now there was a study back in the 90s there's several studies back in the 90s physics education research 
Uh, and there's two that I'd like to highlight. One, it's got the great title, They're Not Dumb, They're Different, uh, which was written by Sheila Tobias. It's a very thin book, very excellent content. I urge you to go look for that. Um, the other is called Talking About Leaving, Why Undergraduates Leave the Sciences. And what they did is they went and interviewed both cases, um, uh, people who were taking physics classes, other STEM classes and asked them um, afterwards, whether they stayed or whether they dropped out, tried to find out why they um, stayed or why they dropped out. And the answer is it's, it's probably not poor grades, it's the same for men and women, but what they found is that women are more likely to switch out of these STEM majors. And the reasons were poor teaching, the attitudes of the departments, the culture, the environment, uh, and that other subjects were more appealing. So these are really interesting studies where they went in and asked the students. And the question is, is this still true at your institution? Have we got the stats? So we should, this was the 1990, mid 90s that these books came out. Now, what's really interesting is this spring, a new version talking about leaving revisited was published. And these authors are actually based at the University of Colorado. So I actually talked with some of them about this issue and they did it again. They went in and interviewed people and found out who was leaving, who was staying, why they left, why they stayed. And the one of the main reasons is this issue of weed out courses where these first and second year classes were intending to um, cut down the numbers because um, they had this idea that, you know, we have these huge undergraduate classes coming in and they felt, well, only the best are the ones who are gonna survive with a physics degree. And it was an issue of attitude of the teachers uh, and purveying this, this sense. And so, um, this was a particularly uh, major issue for women and particularly women of color. And it wasn't an issue of getting bad grades. Um, it was an issue of culture and environment. So I encourage you to, this is another book that I encourage you to go have a look at and read. It's full of very interesting anecdotes and descriptions, not anecdotes. These are interviews, structured interviews, sociological studies, physics education research as to why people persist versus those who move out into other degrees. So addressing this issue of underrepresented minorities, um, when we look, go back and look at the percentage of bachelors going to um, African Americans or Hispanic Americans, you'll see the good news is that the numbers of uh, Hispanic or Latinx uh, Americans has gone up. Uh, it's still below the population, but it's it's doing better. Um, uh, but the bad news is that the proportions of physics bachelors going to African Americans is flat, if not dropping over the past um, 20 years. So we have a serious issue here with race and eth eth ethnic diversity in physics. Uh, same is true in the PhDs. Uh, the numbers are slightly increasing for Latinx, Hispanic, um, uh, but uh, flat for um, Black and African American. And notice the numbers, these numbers are really small. Uh, well, there's 2000 total. Um, you can see that these are very small percentages. Now there was one study that looked at a book that talked about um, to the bottom here, this uh, what, what's it worth, the value of a college majors. And I, in this book, I was reading that um, when you look at African Americans, they uh, tended to uh, go into um, uh, topics, or what they were interested in were, were topics of, that were good for society like school counseling and uh, psychology and so on and so forth, um, which were doing good things for society, but not necessarily the best paid. So um, this was just one hint about how um, 
there's something in the uh, th thought process that says, you know, I don't belong in a physics department. Uh, maybe I belong somewhere else. So in the past year or so, um, organizations across the country have been really trying to think about participation of historically minoritized communities in STEM and trying to do something like, so the University of Colorado, for instance, came to us and said, please, can you find an African-American woman space physicist to a uh, faculty? We'll give them a faculty job. We'll give them the faculty job, right? And you look around and there are exceedingly few, in fact, you know, qualified in the entire country. The problem is that the pipeline, the pathway is not, it's a much earlier problem. It's the high school to college level that we have to address this problem. And the question is, although everybody's looking at this problem and trying to solve the problem, we don't know what's effective nationally or locally, what initiatives. So um, we really have to find what are effective ways and thinking long-term, this problem is not going to be instantly solved um, by a committee or people writing a report or producing PowerPoint presentations or delivering webinars. We need to have um, a systematic effort to increase the population, the underrepresented, the historically minoritized communities and their involvement in STEM. So when we talk about the classroom and what could be done at some classroom undergraduate education, there have been many studies that have been done. Uh, physics education re research is a big field. There's a lot of work being done there. And um, in the best thing that works is group learning, more interaction, more practical questions, make it more social. And uh, you will find that people feel they belong and they're interested and they stay and they persist and they study and they do a lot better. So there's a lot of work that's been done on this. Here's uh, one of these Sansky diagrams um, at a Hispanic serving university and they've had active learning classes and they have a very impressive retention rate. So it is possible, there are ways of doing this. It just takes a bit more effort than the usual big chalk and talk, large lectures. There are many other studies showing ways you can intervene and be effective. I'm not going to go into these. What I think is rather interesting is to think about um, careers in education. If you look at where do people go with a physics bachelor's, uh, only 9% of them become teachers, okay? And so when you look at degrees of uh, high school teachers, uh, people who teach physics, only 24% of them have physics degrees. Um, eight have physics education degrees and 68% have others. So we really need to get more physics majors graduating and going into education and going to high school. So um, this is another statistic, a different source showing uh, only 47% of physics classes are taught by a teacher with a degree in the subject, okay? So uh, we have a problem with the education at the high school level. And you can imagine that this is going to vary quite substantially depending on how um, the wealth of the neighborhood uh, uh, for these schools. The, um, the wealthier neighborhoods are obviously going to be attracting um, more physics teachers rather than the ones um, in the underserved communities. So I did this thought experiment, and maybe my numbers are wrong, but I did a rough estimate and said, well, what would it take to put a physics bachelor in every high school in the US. And I made a rough estimate uh, of 45,000 high schools. I'm not exactly sure how I came up with the number, but maybe you've got a better number. And then I said, say they survive for 15 years. I think that seems quite tough to me, but maybe hopefully they can survive for 15 years. You're gonna need 30,000 physics bachelors per year to go into teaching. Sorry, 3,000 
physics bachelors per year going into teaching. Currently, we get about 720. So you've got to quadruple that number uh, and you need to incentivize, pay better. Um, I think part of the problem is the culture that physics is not a popular topic. Maybe we need to change the name. Let's call it natural sciences or call it fun. I don't know, but we've got a problem with physics not being attractive to um, people and we need to get excited people to take physics and then go into the high schools and excite the students to take physics. So here are my list of things, um, of things that we can do to act locally. Um, the first thing is we need to get the numbers. We need to, to um, find ways to make the classes more interactive. We need to go through some exercises to try and encourage them to stay. There's a lot of physics education research that is here that we can apply. Uh, we need to deal with what I call a sophomore road bump, which is that uh, the second year physics classes start to get really tough. And we need to find ways to encourage people to stick with it um, to get over that road bump. Socialize study spaces and try and get people to work together uh, and study together uh, and involve students in research. It's well known that research involvement um, keeps people in. Um, maybe get if your department, bring in some physics education researchers. I'm not a physics education researcher. I just look at the numbers and enjoy looking at the numbers, but bring in people who've done sociological studies, educational studies, who can help you improve the quality of the teaching and retain the students. Uh, find ways to expand physics education degrees, maybe um, find ways to involve them, uh, actually getting some, some training in, in education uh, and so that they can go into, um, into our high schools and community colleges. Uh, maybe get some joint degrees with other topics to, to expand um, rather than the narrow physics focus that tends to be in the physics degree. And then on top of this, uh, we need to have more non-academic career advice. I think part of the problem is that people see physics as being only academic and don't realize the huge range of careers that you can do with a physics degree. For grad school, uh, there there's an issue of, we need to think about uh, what are the realistic ways of bringing people in to uh, recruiting people to um, physics PhDs, uh, what makes the most successful predictors. I think we're doing some interesting experiments because COVID has meant that a lot of people are not taking the um, GREs, the physics GREs and so on. Um, that's no longer required for entrance. It's gonna be interesting to see how that changes um, the degree, the success at grad school. Um, we need to find ways to be, make the environment better for studying and uh, set clear expectations so that um, expectations of success, so that we get people through the program uh, and um, move on through into the workforce, uh, into realistic real world uh, careers uh, in, in science. So talking of the workforce, um, I want to talk a little bit um, in the next 10 minutes on uh, various surveys that have been happening uh, on the workforce. So moving up from PhDs and beyond. Um, there have been several done in, in astronomy, planetary science and solar and space physics. These are usually motivated by the decadal survey. So we've in the middle of our planetary decadal survey Astro have done theirs, and we've got solar and space physics coming up next year. Unfortunately, for some reason, this, the earth sciences, the space related earth sciences, so we think of, these are usually sponsored by, by NASA and their decadal surveys um, for NASA on the workforce. And, and more importantly, what are we gonna invest in, in NASA? Which missions are we gonna have and so on? Um, but now we're doing the state of the profession um, 
committees, panels, uh, as part of these national surveys, uh, but not in earth science. And earth science needs to be encouraged to get engaged and start doing uh, such workforce services to find out, um, surveys to find out what's going on. The problem also is that although we have four different divisions of NASA, astronomy, planetary science, heliophysics, and earth sciences, there's big overlap between these. So I overlap with planetary science and so on, space physics, with a little bit of astronomy in there. Um, and But th think of the large exoplanets community, um, which is bridging between planetary science and uh, astrophysics. So to understand this, we really need to do um, uh, extensive workforce surveys that, that addresses the overlap between these fields. So for planetary science, we're just wrapping up our decadal survey. And um, for this, we had a statement of the profession. This was the statement of task that we needed to understand the issues of diversity, inclusion, equity, accessibility, find out about workspaces, environments, the um, practical sides of improving the state of the profession. And we wanted, gave some actionable recommendations to NASA to improve this. So um, we've had two workforce surveys of planetary science. The first one um, that I ran in 2011, funded by NASA, involved, um, was done by the AIP, American Institute of Physics, and involve people involved in the LPSC, AGU, and DPS. And um, we got a, a good response rate. Uh, and um, uh, there, and then we did another one in 2020. I, NASA um, found legal issues, why it felt that they couldn't fund it. It was eventually funded by DPS, Division of Planetary Science. Uh, and in this case, AGU dropped out, and um, but we brought in the GSA. And so um, we had a, um, a similar study. But notice we're missing astrobiology, American Meteorological Society. It's not clear that we have the exoplanet community, the space physics community. So um, it's difficult to do these surveys and get all planetary scientists. But what we do find is that when we add up the numbers, we've got something in the US of about 1,500 to 2,000 people who have PhDs and work in planetary science in the US. And um, what we find when we look at the demographics of that community is that, uh, yes, it's predominantly male, but the percentage of women has been increasing from 25 to 35%. Uh, in planetary science. Um, and although it's predominantly white, um, that percentage has dropped and the slightly larger non-white um, other ethnic, uh, racial and ethnic uh, populations. But those numbers are small. It is very dominantly a um, white population. When we look at the uh, undergraduate degrees, we find that 40% um, have physics degrees. So this is why I've been emphasizing the physics undergraduate degree. Uh, geophysics and geology come next um, with a smattering of other topics. When you go to the PhD, however, you'll see 40% have planetary science PhDs, uh, then geology, geophysics, and physics, and so on. So. Um, Planetary science is actually very interdisciplinary. It's a very broad field. It covers all sorts of areas and getting more interdisciplinary as astrobiology is sort of cranking up and becoming a major part of our field. We look at employment. What we see is that 48% are employed at a university and the rest at a bunch of nonprofits or NASA labs. But the, the total number working at NASA labs is actually quite small in research, not what you might expect. The total number of people employed in the field, planetary science is considerably smaller than about half the size of solar and space physics and smaller than astrophysics. Um, we have to keep that in mind when we look at our um, funding in NASA. 
uh, when we compare the um, demographics of planetary science compared with other um, divisions of NASA, they're very similar, again, dominated by a white population with limited um, race and ethnic minorities and um, percentage of women about the same, a little lower for heliophysics than the other areas. So when we look at planetary science, we also did a, a survey of the departments and there are 54 departments that have at least one faculty member um, who are in planetary science. But when you look at the, um, the top 10, they really dominate the field and surprise, surprise, Arizona State University is the university that has produced the most bachelors, the most PhDs, uh, and it's not to number new, two place for tenured and tenure track faculty um, by University of Arizona. But you can see comparing the um, 2011 and 2018 surveys, there's sort of some changes. Some things go up, some things have gone down for reasons I don't quite understand. Um, but really what I want you to realize here is the field of planetary science and the number of departments is really, really small. And only a few departments contribute substantially to the majority of PhDs being produced in our field. It's a very small field. And so um, it would be nice to have better numbers. It would be nice to see if we could improve our understanding of this pathway into, into our workforce. Um, but, but it's um, a small number of departments and um, not well documented. Now, one of the things I've been doing as well as the decadal survey is to be uh, co-chair of this National Academy study on how to increase the diversity and inclusion in the leadership of competed space missions. And this is something that NASA has directed and we've been gathering um, data for this. I just want to show you a few things. One set of data has come from the NSPIRES, the NASA um, online uh, where you submit your proposals and in there there's a personal profile that you're supposed to fill out and when we look at those um, you see under gender uh, that those numbers tend to be 19 to 23 um, percent women and about 70 percent men with a fairly large number uh, 10 percent or so that people prefer not to answer for some reason when we look at um, race and ethnicity, yes, dominantly um, 60 or so percent uh, white with uh, 10 to 20 percent Asian. Um, fairly large number, 20 percent preferring not to answer and then tiny slivers of other very uh, small uh, minorities of Black and African American and Latinx. So um, we have a we have a severe lack of diversity in our workforce. When we look at the competed mission proposals, it's interesting. Uh, this is a study that's been done by Michael New, and we just look at the last ten years. Uh, what you see here is that depending on mission size. There's a big uh, range. Now, what's interesting is you'll see, if you look at the scales, heliophysics, astro heliophysics, earth science, a relatively small number of proposals compared with planetary, which is um, twice to three times the number of proposals. Um, and um, for planetary science is the only division that has competed large missions. Those are the, the um, New Frontiers missions. We don't have any small in um, proposed missions because those are mostly Earth orbit. And there's not much planetary science you can do from Earth orbit. But you will see very dominantly that these proposals are very much dominated by um, men PIs. Uh, when we look at the mission size 
and compare these again um, with gender. On the left is the accepted mission proposals. And you can see that there are zero in astrophysics and Earth with women PIs and um, very few in heliophysics, whereas planetary has a relatively um, reasonable representation of women. And you can see on the right is the acceptance rates. And you can see that um, you know, women PIs are having a reasonably um, good acceptance rate, both for heliophysics and for planetary science. When you look as a function of uh, age, uh, academic age of the PIs, then um, what you see is on the left at the submitted and the right is the accepted. What is interesting is that most of the PIs had got their PhDs over 25 years ago. And so then if you look at, at on the right hand side, 25 years ago, the percentage of PhDs in physics and astronomy going to women is relatively small. And so then maybe not so surprisingly, um, there are fewer proposals um, in these areas with, with women PIs, but that really doesn't explain the zero for astrophysics, earth science, and in planetary science, we have a substantial fraction. So these are all interesting numbers to do with the um, with the missions, and uh, we're just digesting, digesting these and trying to come up with recommendations to NASA how they can improve the uh, diversity of these PIs. So here is my last uh, message, uh, solutions on a national scale. We need to get more data on the workforce. We need to do this in a more systematic way. Um, we need to understand how the field is changing. We need to understand um, the, how the workforce um, is diversifying, how much of that is related to bringing in researchers from um, abroad versus those that are in the US. And what is the workforce that we need for the next decade or more uh, in our field? And how do we um, diversify that workforce to address our needs? The biggest issue in my mind is education. We need to make physics, physical sciences a high priority at school, high school, college, and at graduate level, and particularly in historically minoritized communities. We need to do the research. Why do students drop out of these fields and how do we encourage them to stay? Surely the US can do better than um, 8,600 physics majors out of a population of over 300 million. And with that thought, I will thank you very much and leave you with a quote from Hypatia of Alexandria. Reserve your right to think, for even to think wrongly is better than not to think at all. And with that, I will thank you very much and take questions. I'll stop sharing. Thank you very much. Uh, Sorry, so I ran a bit late. On. What's that? Sorry, I ran late. So far away with the questions. That's okay. We got time for a few questions. So uh, those online, please put questions in the Q and A. There's at least one question here in the room, at least two. So go ahead. Uh, hi there. Uh, regarding the amount of people going into physics uh, positions in high schools, does the education system in different states affect how many people go into physics education in high schools? And if so, how can we address the problem and aid it? Oh, that's a great question. That's a great question. You know, I don't know that exact answer to that, but I'm pretty certain the answer is yes, there is a big variation uh, across the different states. And that, I, I, I wish I knew the, uh, knew the actual de details, but yes, I, I bet you the answer is yes. And why they're different in different, different places and how they're different would be really interesting to look at. If you dig into that, send me what you find. Thank you. All right, um, are there any questions online? There's, no, there's another question in the room, so why don't we take that one? 
Um, um, yeah, hi. Um, it was a very insightful talk and I um, enjoyed it. Uh, I have a question regarding the uh, pathway leaking at, uh, you know, the high school college level. Do you think there might be some value to investigate in the um, domestic upbringing and family culture direction of the minority communities rather than the education system? Yes, absolutely. Actually, I, there's, there's, um, I've been reading some interesting articles along similar lines. I think there is an issue about um, wanting to stay in your community and um, not wanting to leave your community. And so then maybe instead of, of, of pulling people out of um, historically minoritized communities and getting them to go somewhere else, you know, maybe we need to go to their community and deliver the physics to their schools and to their, and, and you know, take our exciting planetary science exploration and go and show them all the cool stuff that you can do with science um, and encourage them to stick with their math and to help them with their math and physics so that they can move forward. You know, living here in Boulder, which is a lily white, I mean, it really is um, middle-class educated population. Um, I think there's probably more PhDs per capita here in Boulder than just about anywhere in the country. Um, you know, we can't just attract people to come to our university and to come and live here. We have to go and work, you know, go. I visited high schools, rural high schools, um, high schools in Denver and down in Pueblo and places and um, tell them about the exciting stuff that we're doing. We need to do a lot more of that. Yeah. So we have, we have some questions online. Um, are there any studies looking at STEM degree outcomes for students with serious psychiatric health conditions? And if not, is this something that might be investigated in the future to see what impact such conditions have on different demographic groups and their success in STEM? I don't know. Yeah, I really don't know. That's a great question for physics education researchers. I'm sorry. That would be a good one to look at. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. It's all right. I mean, I think I, uh, there's some other questions here. I think that that also, ref, you know, the answer is going to be similar. That the data are pretty limited, right, in what we actually know. Um, so there's a question here about non-binary uh, scientists and having them lumped in with women or excluded. And I suspect the answer is the data are just not very good, right? Okay. So we started looking at 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 uh, more at something other than binary gender in um, the the um, planetary science survey. Um, so those numbers are there, with, with limited numbers are there. Um, the NASA numbers are very limited, extremely limited in their complexity, very limited what they look at. So if you look at the decadal, it, sorry, if you look at the workforce numbers for um, planetary science, and those are actually available online, and are in the um, white papers. There are a planetary, there are white papers associated with the decadal. They are beginning to address this issue. And um, I tell you what, I'm gonna give you these, uh, a, a PDF with the slides and I'll include in that the references for these white papers and the decadal so that you can go look up this stuff. That's great. We'll we'll post that with a with the recording of the lecture. Um, last question is one more question in the room. Is this picking up? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Hi. Um, my question was about um, the high school data, the high school students. Um, you know, you showed that there's this big drop off uh, going from high school to entering college, if I recall correctly. And my question was, um, when you're looking at the high school students, what is that number reflecting? Because most schools in the US, we don't have uh, like high school majors, right? Pretty much everyone takes the same classes. So is that number people who expressed interest in going into physics or what was that? Well, that's people who 
take physics at high school. So you're right um, that that doesn't mean that these are people at high school who are jumping up and down and excited about physics. Um, they're taking it and sometimes it's because they're just expected to and they have to and they have a lot of choice in the matter. Um, on the other hand, um, it, it, it's important to find out, uh, you know, if you, if you go to a physics class at college, a large number of the students taking those classes are not majoring in physics, they're taking something else. They're doing it because it's a requirement. So in some ways I would say it's similar to high school in that respect that you're sort of, it's a requirement that you have to do it along the way rather than voluntary. So the big concern is why is there a big drop off as you go from high school to first year college to graduating? And that's where the numbers just plummet. All right, well, thank you. In the interest of time, I think we need to wrap it up. So thanks very much for a, a, a thought-provoking presentation. Um, we hope to get you out here in person to, to uh, continue this kind of conversation, as well as to hear about some of the exciting science that you're doing and have been involved with. So, so Fran, thanks. thanks again. That's a great pleasure. Could you leave the Zoom up so I can have a look at the chat and the Q&A, please? Sure, we can leave this running. Yeah, we'll stop the recording then.